for me to see in that. <laughs> What's the foot? I tried to. Cat. Cat in the <laughs> Hello, and welcome to The Wedge. I'm your host, Dr. Joyce Del Rosario. This video cast highlights Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders working towards social justice. We call it the wedge because Asian Americans are often wedged in the black and white binary conversations on race. We are tossed around as either model minorities or the perpetual foreigners who have the Kung flu. But really, API folks are positioned to help break the binary conversations to move us toward justice and equity for all people. The Wedge introduces Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders who are doing great things in their community. In this first season, we will focus on API pastors, practitioners, and academics who have invested themselves in solidarity with Black Lives Matter. I hope you enjoy this series. Today, I get to introduce you all to my wonderful friend, Lena Thompson. Um, and I think I, I warned her a little bit just before this that I was going to get a little emotional. I think part of the reason why is Lena is one of the first women of color that I ever got to sit under their leadership. She was one of the first, she is the first female preacher I've ever heard. And I grew up in a United Methodist church. And so we had female preachers. I just never saw them. <laughs> um, but uh, Lena is, well, I'll let you introduce yourself, but I, I did want to I couldn't let this opportunity go by without saying how important you've been to my life, um, how shaping you've been as a woman, as a woman of color, as a brown woman, as um, a pastor. Um, you are one of the first people to help me understand and solidify the need for justice. Um, I think back then in the 90s, we you know talked about it in terms of diversity and inclusion. Um, Mm -hmm. But it didn't become a justice issue um, until a little, or we didn't use that language until later. But I think you were always teaching that all along. And so this is my um, thank you to you, Lena. But um, also, I wanted others to, to hear your voice and to, to know all the great stuff you've got going on in Burien. So let me give it to you and let you introduce yourself and identify yourself. Who are you? What do you do? Where are you? All that great stuff. <laughs> Thanks, Joyce. Um, and thanks for the the chance to give us another good excuse just to talk, yeah. catch up. Um, so um, I am the pastor at Lake Burien Presbyterian Church. Um, and Burien is just, it's a city, it's a smaller city just south of um, Seattle. But we butt up right to the, um, right to the city. Um, and so I've been at that church now for um, going on full time, full time going on. This is my sixth year, but I was there for three years before that as a part time associate. It was a contract, part time associate. And it was really uh, just to give me a chance to go, you know, is this what I'm supposed to be doing with my life? Because I never, as you know, we've talked about this many times, never, ever. Uh, thought I would end up being a pastor, didn't want to be one. But, you know, it's one of those things where people say it's a calling, but for me, somebody described it as a haunting. And <laughs> yeah. it, it more felt like I was, it was coming after me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, you know, I'd spent, at that point, I'd already been in full-time ministry for 25 years, working in two parachurch organizations with we are both familiar with um yeah so i spent large international organizations yep yeah large international organizations and my my sense of calling it was really shaped in youth and community development youth and community-based ministry so you know when i said yes to sort of you know god around congregational ministry it was really about um learning that congregational ministry can be a powerful partner to transformation in community if congregations know how to engage well. And I hadn't, honestly, I hadn't seen that model very many times. Um, and, and so that's what was pulling me to congregation ministry was just going, what is the possibility of community transformation if 
the faith community, I, literally the church community is, is, you know, can engage a little bit with their resources and their history and their, you know, res resources like property, um, you know, mm -hmm. who can they be? Because they're there. Churches are located, right, in communities. So yeah. that's and how it's it, so for a lot of churches, right? Like, yeah. they've been there in their neighborhoods for a long time. Yes, exactly. And, you know, in this, in my particular context, it's a Presbyterian church. Um, this is kind of where I'm ordained. You know, the neighborhoods have changed all around them. You know, yeah, this particular church that I'm at um, has been there for almost 100 years. Um, and, wow. you know, the communities, obviously communities are going to change a lot, but, you know, it's, it's a vastly different community even than it was 10 or 15 years ago. So congregations, as we well know, especially mainline denominations, don't always make that, turn that corner very well. Um, and so that was my sense of calling to this particular congregation and also because it's very much a part of the community where you know right next to the community that I grew up in the neighborhood we're neighbors to this community that I'm serving now in so there was a there was also a sense of calling to place um, so yeah that's kind of where I've been I've been the installed um, lead it's funny to say lead pastor because I'm the only pastor <laughs> You can Solo pastor. The head yeah. executive, uh, senior pastor, um, queen bee. <laughs> queen bee pastor. Um, yeah, and I've been there for, I've started my sixth year serving nice. there. Uh, yeah. And ethnically, you identify as? Pacific Islander, Samoan. Samoan. Mm -hmm. okay. In particular, I invited you here because I wanted to hear about what you did, your church did. Um, <clears throat> I'm friends with a number of people at your church and, um, and I saw on the Facebook feed, we all were doing a pilgrimage of sorts. Yep. And this mm -hmm. is before COVID, this was before George, all of that. So tell, tell us about what happened and then what came out of that. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it kind of, I need to go back just a little bit. When I came to this congregation, like I said, you know, I, they were, they were, I think they were a pretty typical Presbyterian congregation, mostly all white, um, elderly, and um, and they hadn't yet experienced like this sharp, sharp decline, but they were definitely <laughs> trending in that direction. Um, and so when I got there, they the the pastor that was before me had tried, and they also were trying to do little things to reach the community, you know. And so one of the things that they did was they started an elementary after school program 13, 14 years ago. To the neighborhood school our neighborhoods changed it's 80 percent you know kids of color free and reduced lunch all of that so that's a little bit of the neighborhood so when i came they specifically wanted me to help them be more engaged which for you know you know i'm like do we really want to be more engaged because we're gonna have to talk a little bit more than you know <laughs> yeah the after Cheering. school programming which is huge right yep. so when I got there, that's what I started doing. Just started kind of peppering in and trying to get a sense for their their level of kind of engage, like, do they really want to? And, you know, little by little by little, they were becoming more and more curious. And being a woman of color as a leader, as the associate was an interesting thing in all of itself. When he left after three years, um, I my contract was over. And so I was like, okay. He, the senior pastor. The senior pastor, pastor before oh. me that I worked with, who's a friend. He did a great job uh, kind of trying to help them turn this corner. When he left, the session invited me to stay on and become their pastor, which I was not really planning on that because I was, after three years of part-time, I'm going, this is like, I know transformation in community and in organizations is a very, very long journey. And I was like, oh, I don't know if I have that in me and I don't know if they have that in them but listening to the session articulate why they want to change was just drew me I thought okay we've come this far they don't want to go back let's go so I said yes well at that point I knew that we were going to have to directly talk about issues of race in the church because I'm your pastor and so you need to know that when I stand up in front and preach every Sunday that I see that I'm preaching to a 
congregation that has wonderful people in it, but if we don't make some changes, we won't be here. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have hard conversations about race and it's not going away because I'm not going away and I'm in front of you every week, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's how we started. You know, it was really intentional every week, just preaching about justice. It was every week. Pause right there. I mean, that's, that's not typical for small dying churches to have a pastor talking about justice. Yeah. I mean, and really lifting in concrete ways to them, how, how we as the church have been deficient in preaching justice and discipling people with a justice lens. And the more I would talk about that, and it was just, it wasn't me. There were, you came and preached, you know, I, ha- I, I was very intentional. I asked our session, I said, if I say yes to this, I need, I'd like to have a budget to bring people in to preach so that you're not just hearing me and you don't think it's just my mm. thing. Mm. So it was a steady course of that for a year, talking about race, talking about privilege. I mean, we kind of were very intentional about where we planted these thoughts. Mm. So after about a year, they're like, okay, we get it, you know, which, you know, <laughs> they're like, they're, they're, they were like, what can we do? What can we do? I'm like, we're not doing anything because the last thing that I want is having people out there trying to do stuff and making it worse, mm, you know? Yes. <laughs> So um, after, after about a year, there was enough of a kind of a, a desire for people that wanted to go deeper. So we invited um, the People's Institute um, to come do their Undoing Institutional Racism workshop. 40 mm-hmm. people from our church and partners in our community, half white, half people of color. Two, I didn't think it was a shock because people actually signed up for it. And it was, you know, I don't know when you can get church folks to say yes to two eight hour trainings back to back. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they did. So that was the second year or the third year. And that opened up a lot because now we're like, it, you know, 40 people, 35 people, that's a almost, you know, a third or more of our congregation. So there was enough of a critical mass to kind of get conversations in the community, in the, the faith community. Well, um, fast forward. Um, Wait, can I, can I pause for a second? You, mm-hmm. Because you talked about bringing in other preachers too and other voices. Um, mm-hmm. But I also want to point out because, you know, there may be some other pastors listening who may want to do this kind of work. You also brought in other people of color. And, and oh, yeah. was your, so it wasn't, it, it wasn't this, the same congregation doing the same thing. They were also now having to be in relationship with new people and new church folks that they didn't previously have relationship with. And so I think that's an important piece to what you were doing. Yes. Yeah, it was absolutely, again, you know, it's not that I love white people. <laughs> Some of them are my best friends, um, <laughs> but you know, I needed them to actually hear and see, you know, people who were different. And you know, we laugh about it, but you know, I still am. You know, there's a lot of white folks that don't have any friends that are people of yeah. color. Yeah, Wait, that's why I had to point it out. I was like, let's make sure that was part of your maybe mm-hmm. explicit or implicit strategy was to oh. also diversify the congregation. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So lots of different voices and it was you know male and female and african-american yourself you know there was a very diverse older younger um and it was it was interesting because i think it was started to awaken people to go we we have not heard the gospel in this way mm-hmm. i've had a, several people from the congregation say i grew up you know these are people that now some of them have been there for 50 years and we've never heard that story that way. Yeah. You know, which is awesome as a preacher to go, that's, that's awesome. But then it's also like, really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How did we miss justice? I am, you know, so, and there's a lots of reasons why we miss justice. Um, so um, the other thing that I think was happening is uh, there are, were people of color starting to, join the congregation because of, you know, this is a community that I grew up in. And so a lot of friends and young people who are mentored by 
the youth workers that were also coming to the church, mm -hmm. they started bringing their friends. And so now the congregation is starting to look different, you know, still a number of seniors, but also there's young adults that are coming there in their twenties. And these are young adult leaders of color who are doing justice work in the community. Mm -hmm. And so they had very little patience well, they had a lot of grace towards the white folks, but they're also like, dang, you know, <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow, Lena, you know, and, and getting them to come, was like, please, y'all, please just come. Yeah, I just need to see some people that look, I had to see people that look like me. I yeah. wasn't going to make, you know, so, um, and so these young adults, they're, they're, you know, they're 25, 26 now. When, when I knew some of them, they were in high school. Um, but they're all doing wonderful work in the community. And they started a young adult group in the church that's pretty um, justice oriented because that's who they are in their lives right now. Mm -hmm. And so they connected with a woman in our church who um, was a theology professor at Seattle Pacific University. Shannon um, Smythe is her name. Shannon had just come back from a pilgrimage with uh, Lisa Sharon Harper, the Freedom Road pilgrimage. Um, Shannon took some students one summer, came back, talked about it, was so excited about it. Our young adults got fired up about it. And so we said, let's do it. And so rather than just being a young adult trip, the young adults planned it, but we made it a intergenerational uh, pilgrimage. So 30 people, half people of color, half white, half over 30, half younger, under 30, which was very intentional as well. Mm. So we did that last summer of 2019. Um, it was, you know, I've, I've said this in other places, it's the best education I've ever had, including seminary. Mm. Um, wow. Yeah, I, I learned so much. I, I learned things that I, I thought I knew just because of my own you know, training and relationships and friendships with people, but I had no idea, you wow. know. Yeah, we started in Montgomery, Alabama, mm -hmm. spent two days there, um, and then went. The got on lynching Museum is there, right? Yeah, the National Lynching Memorial is there. The, um, the Peace and Justice Memorial is there with, um, uh, um, yeah, it, it, everything. It was just a lot. I mean, where our hotel was, was right on the main street in Montgomery. And if you go down to one end is the river where they brought enslaved folks to Montgomery to, you know, to sell. Mm -hmm. And so they, they walked right down the road, right in front of the hotel to the center of the town, which was just a few blocks from us, where there was the auction block. Wow. And so we did, you know, um, Dr. King's church was there, the Montgomery bus boycott, all of that rich, real history. And, you know, Lisa says that the land tells the story, which I don't think I ever understood that until I actually was on the land and the land was telling us the story of what happened. You can't deny that, you know, I think for those of us who read it in books or hear about it, it's easy to, to not get, not get the reality of all of it. Mm -hmm. And so it was profound. We, we started there. I can say more about that, but there's so much history and richness in Montgomery. And then we got on the bus and went to um, three different uh, little towns in um, Mississippi, one of which was where Emmett Till was murdered. Mm -hmm. So we went to the, the storefront where the corner where all that happened. Um, and we had Lisa had people that were part of the civil rights movement these guys are still alive you know they're still with us mm -hmm. so we had one gentleman um who was on who rode the bus with us from um in while we were in mississippi took us around he was there he was there with that you know the stokely carmichael thing the you know he organized with um fanny lou hamer um he was mm -hmm. actually kind of, he was Fanny, he was in his 20s at the time, and she was in her 40s, and mm -hmm. he was kind of her, you know, like, what you'd call them now, what do they call them, the 
armor bearer, right? Like, <laughs> right, right. He, he, he got her to where she needed to be. I mean, he loved her. He, mm. you know, it was just all the stories that he told about their friendship. Um, and so he was with us on one of, while we were in Mississippi. And then we went from there to um, Memphis and spent a day at the um, Civil Rights Museum. Um, also at one of the sites that we were at in Memphis met with a gentleman who was part of the um, I am a man strike um, the sanitation yeah. worker strike in Memphis uh -huh. again in his 70s yeah. still working um, and so he spent the day with us talked to us about that you know what happened he was there talked to us about the you know Dr. King's speech talked to us about the strike itself and it, it was funny I was talking to my sister Pat about this and she said, you know, the one thing that they both you know, it like really encouraged us to do was please, you know, get people out to vote. You know, these guys are still talking about the vote, mm -hmm. which, you know, right. right. And so, yeah, so we, we went there and then our last um, kind of stop was at the, uh, was in um, Ferguson, Missouri. And so we went to the site of Michael Brown's murder uh, walked into the neighborhood to the street right where he was and so the whole idea behind the kind of the the thread of um, the story is the enslavement and confinement of african-american bodies on our soil mm -hmm. right and so she follows or the 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 journey follows kind of that story um which if it can be it that story in itself can is kind of can be the thread through anything. But when you look at that thread and you see the very clear line between enslavement to mass incarceration, it's like, you mm -hmm. know, it's all, it's not an accident. Yeah. <laughs> um, the way that we have uh, dehumanized and um, brutalized African-American bodies since day one um, is, was it, you can't miss it. And if, as far as our congregation goes, those those folks that went on the trip, um, I know that they're changed forever. Mm -hmm. They they have changed. They they're everything they're doing has been now they're they're thoughtful about the things that they're hearing and engaging in and what they're saying. And so when we got back, um, you know, we were trying to figure. I asked folks in our congregation to please not bombard us you know give people time and so for a week we you know we came back and people all the folks in our congregation were just they were like we want to talk we want to hear and they followed us we we created a, a a really simple way for people to follow our journey um in real time mm -hmm. and so folks wanted to talk and um there was a few people on our trip that are super creative decided let's let's create a kind of like a museum i guess or um, an exhibit. Mm -hmm. It was so well done. It rivals almost anything. We had people tell, museum people tell us this, wow, this is some of the best things. And, and in the Northwest, there was, there's nothing in the Northwest. There are very few places in the Northwest where people can go and hear the story because the exhibit was set up to tell the story. And the exhibit right? was in the church. It was in the church. Yeah. 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 So we gave over the sanctuary. Actually, the sanctuary was um, the protest. It was the last part of the exhibit and they turned it into kind of this protest scene. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't know what was going on because they didn't want me to see it until it was finished. And so I walk in and I'm like, wow, you know, they, they created cardboard silhouettes all throughout the sanctuary that were protesters, wow. signs up all over the place black lives matter you know it was very much it was so well done i was so proud of our folks um but yeah we thought that we were going to keep the exhibit up for you know two or three weeks for our church to kind of see but then word got out and we ended up keeping it up for almost two or th well, three months they hit the news it was on the news it was on the local news right like yeah word got out not just like social media but like yeah, I mean, there were people coming from all over and, you know, there was, I think we had over 1200 people come through. Wow. I'm like, okay, put out the offering basket. <laughs> <laughs> That's real. That's real. <laughs> come on. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your Thank you for coming. Yeah. So, and, and it, it was open. We kept it open for um, until late October or November. And then, um, and, you wow. know, 
we did it every it was open every day and then toward the end we kept it open for you know two days a week or something the other thing one of the other reasons we kept it open is because there were educators that came because it started in the summer so there were educators that came by and said would you consider leaving it open so that when school starts we can bring our kids mm. and so one of the schools that visited changed their curriculum which normally addressed you know, that part of U.S. history in April, they moved it to the fall so that they could bring the kids to the exhibit. Yeah. It, it became a really, organizations brought their staff and as a way to talk about, you know, race and equity. And then we, they'd invite one of our people to come in and talk to them about the experience. So it was a real education mm. tool. So all that to say, that was last summer. You know, when this, when March hit, I feel like wow. because of the work that had been happening, our folks are, were rooted. They understood the issues for the most part. Those that don't have other people that can kind of walk alongside in the conversation. So three years ago, you started preaching justice to a church that wasn't- Five years ago. Five years ago. Five years ago, I started preaching justice to a church that wasn't ready for it, that wasn't thinking about it too much. Mm -hmm. And then the slow build. And then, and, and, and it's not like you planned it, like, here's my five-year plan. We're going to go on, like, okay. but this, right. this is what came out of that. And then, mm -hmm. so where are you at now with it? I mean, like, and then, <laughs> and then this summer, 2020 hit and. <laughs> so, um, you know, we're continuing to, so what, what's been helpful about this journey that we've been on is now we've been able to take this justice conversation and talk about the issues of injustice in our own neighborhood. Mm. So, you know, we've been able to, to engage um, folks around renters' rights, renters' protections in our community. Our church was very involved in um, a coalition, a renters' coalition for uh, folks in our, in our community. We realized that our city, this is a long story, but it goes back to a, an apartment complex that was bought out and evicting residents, right? with no notice, which apparently they had no rights because there were no renters rights and protections in the city. Mm -hmm. And so when that happened, we got engaged there, trying to advocate for the residents that were living there, tried to, you know, help the city slow the sale down, tried to find, raise money to help people for relocation, all that stuff that was going along, uh, which led then into us joining a coalition of other uh, community partners that were um, going to, you know, advocate for a whole platform of renters' rights, which we did last September, and Burien became just the second city behind Seattle to have a, a, a slate of renters' protections, including, you know, what they called, you know, just cause, meaning you can't just evict people just because you want, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. You're here are, there's just a few reasons, you know, other than that, you can't do that, which mm -hmm. happens all the time. Yep. Um, so, you know, all this, these conversations about justice now that we're having, you know, in the, in the congregation, you know, the disparities in some of those uh, issues that, you know, adversely affect people of color, you know, the conversation about all of that, and mostly about, yeah, you know, this is where God's heart is, like, this is where God is, like, that is God's concern, you know, and when we don't see that the people that God centers in God's own activity and God's heart, when we totally missed who it is that God is centering in these conversations. And that's the fault of the preacher, the fault of the church historically to not tell those stories, which is clearly to me, you know, another one of those supremacist things that happens, mm -hmm. right? We're not going to tell the whole story. Because if we do, we're going to lose, you know, we're going to lose our power, our supremacy over others, right? Yeah. And so things like that, it's helpful to have like both biblical and theological hooks to hang things on for people when they, when we start talking about, you know, why do we need to advocate right now for um, all kids in our district to have access to the internet? Mm -hmm. You know, why does every, you know, what, what can we do? Who do we need to talk to? Yes, we can raise money to help buy devices for kids, but we also need to talk about why is yeah. there not internet access? Yep. Right. Yep. So like those are all devices useless if you don't, if you can't get the internet, like, <laughs> right. you know, and also, I don't know what, 
right now, you know, learning our school district just announced, you know, two weeks ago that they are going to, you know, um, be online, all distance, all distance learning for the fall. Yeah. Well, you know, we know who that's going to impact the most. Yep. And so what can our, because our church is really situated in a great place in terms of relationships and community and, you know, I think we have a reputation now of being a, a, a resource and a help mm -hmm. and, and a place to go, you know, let's, it's funny, you know, I hear other people talking to each other and hearing them say, just call Lake Burien, you know, if they can do anything, you know, they'll help. But I'm always, um, you know, we started a COVID-19 fund. Mm -hmm march with a many with a few other partners and you know where it's housed at the church we didn't know what that it raised over it's it's raised a hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars um wow. but it's super local you know a lot of people say well how much of that came from you know foundations like no we raised almost seventy thousand dollars just from the community wow. like people yeah right yeah, yeah. the story that you're kind of painting for us um Pastor Shonda Ja in Oakland um, helped me see this um, in her teaching. But you went from after school tutoring, which is more community development work, to social transformation, where you're doing policy, and you're advocating for in, um, transformation individually and community wide and publicly. Um, and so the, the work of justice just got so much deeper at that point. It moved from um, mm. And, and I, I think I'm just wanting to point it out because I, I did community development work for so long, it, <clears throat> it couldn't address the justice issues. It was good for a, a certain need that we had, whether it was even housing, you know, I, I, I did housing for a little while um, or after school programs or, or whatever it is, but it doesn't address the systemic issues the way that you, you saw your congregation unfolding um, to the point of rent and to the point of internet access and things like that. So um, anyway, I just wanted to kind of regroup us and take us back to that point. Yeah, because I think that, I mean, Christians, right? Christians in general are not, and again, it's because the, the, the conversation of shalom, right? Like justice and, um, you know, what I would add equity and thriving and all of that is such a fuller, um, conversation than the church has really ever had, especially the white church, right? And white evangelicals, white, there, there hasn't been, it's big, yeah, I have a lot of thoughts about that, but because we haven't really, um, you know, understood the fullness of what that means. And so when you, when, when we have limited, and you know this, when you limit salvation to be just about your individual, like, yeah. you know, walk with Jesus. Um, and you don't, you know, kind of paint the bigger picture of God's intent and desire for all people and the earth. And, um, and so that's just a, it's a, just a glaring missing part of our discipleship conversations. Um, yeah. And so it's, it's interesting when you are then, you know, working in a context in a Christian congregation context where that is a new thought, literally like thing, you know, it begins to sort of shape now the way that people are seeing everything. Um, and so I do think it's part of our responsibilities as you know, pastors and folks in Christian leadership development of others um, to create the environment and paint the picture, help folks connect all of the dots, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so it's been, um, it's, been a wonderful, you know, I think everything that I ever thought about why congregational ministry is important, I'm seeing, you know, and then on the city, on the side of, you know, the city or the community, you know, they're shocked. Like my friend and I were laughing the other day. It's like, um, I think nobody at the city is saying, you know, faith community, we don't want you. The school district is not saying, faith community, we don't want you, right? In fact, it's been the opposite. We need to know how to show up with the right, you know, posture and the right understanding. But generally, especially in urban communities, folks know it, it takes a lot of people. 
and it takes all sectors to make it go. Um, and so, but we do find it funny that, you know, in a, in a, the region like the Northwest, people are shocked when the church folk want to come and, and engage. Yeah. yeah. Um, but we, but we got to be, you know, we got to learn how to do that well. You know, some of us still don't know how to come in and sit and be quiet before we want to talk to everybody about Jesus. <laughs> yes, that'll preach too. Which, which actually kind of leads me to my last question for you. Um, I think this is where, particularly, and I'm going to be super, super biased, but API women, we have a unique position in, you know, and I, and I kind of talk, you know, I call it the wedge because we're sort of wedged in the black and white binary. Yep. Sometimes okay. uses a pawn, sometimes. Good image, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, anyway, I took it from an article in, um, in here, so I can't take that for myself. That was <laughs> Kenji, me too. Anyway, um, but I think the other part of being the wedge is we have an opportunity to be able to create some change or interrogate some of the old ways of doing things that haven't been working. And so as a, you know, a Samoan female pastor and all of your intersections and, and all of who you are, um, my last question for you is, what does that mean for you? What does it mean in your family? What does it mean for you as you, you know, lead in, um, in your community to, to other people of other ethnicities and um, yeah, how is it as you embody yourself in the world um, personally? Yeah, well, it's taken a really interesting, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's a really interesting time, you know, to be addressing the question that you're raising because, you know, we're doing the work in our own PI community to actually interrogate our anti-blackness mm -hmm. as Pacific Islanders. And so there's that part of the work that I'm involved in and, you know, deeply rooted anti-black sentiments, you know, that we were all raised with. Mm -hmm. And so there's that conversation with others that I'm in and trying to help all of us, you know, understand what it means to be in solidarity what it means to say, you know, our story is important, but, you know, but this is not a competition between, you know, whose story is, who is most, you know, oppressed because, mm -hmm. and, and really trying to help, this is my own feeling, and I've felt this way all of my life, um, that the African American story has to be centered because there's so much of our well being that is tied to that, you know, that community story, whether we want to admit it or not. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a little bit of, you know, um, my, my own journey right now that's been a little bit different in some ways. Um, um, <clears throat> so I think, I do think that um, that doesn't erase us, you know, which that's, I think, a lot of some conversations that I am in with our people is like, you know, well, what about us? Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm like, nobody's trying to erase us, right? Um, but it feels and, like it, right? It feels like a zero sum mm -hmm. game. Yeah. Well, if yeah. we center them, then we are no longer. Exist. Which is, it, it's so like, it speaks to our, you know, kind of um, the way that we understand the world and the way that we understand God, as if God's grace isn't enough for everybody. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. Um, and so we, we get into that, you know, the whole scarcity mindset of, you know, how much is there? Is there enough for me? And, um, and instead of kind of going, you know, I, because of, because I am concerned about your well-being, you know, that is why I do this, because in your well-being is mine, mm -hmm. you know? And so that's, that's a little bit of the, um, you know, that work that you're naming right now that my life is, um, in, you know, has become a big part of my life is actually now explicitly in many ways organizing in just RPI community around some of this issue. And then also about the particularities of say, you know, COVID-19 and its impact on the PI community. Um, all the things, you know, I think we can, we can 
advocate for what we need and we can have we can bring our perspective our story our unique you know contributions without feeling like we're we're in a fight right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um we can actually do both yeah um and so you know that's that's sort of it's so layered isn't it it's just like was well, such an interesting time to be alive it is um i think the other thing that i would say about um you know, heritage or, you know, my, my own situatedness and story, you know, I think there are things, there are certain unique um, charisms that people bring, a people can bring to the holistic kind of shalom community, beloved community that people, a people can bring and bring their part. Um, and I, I think that there are unique and beautiful things about our story, our heritage as Pacific Islanders that can be a, a and I've seen it. I know, you know, I feel what, like what are I, the things? Name the things I want to hear. I know, but yeah, I think <laughs> I there's a, there is a um, kind of a an understanding of community, mm -hmm. right? That um, we share, mm -hmm. right? And we we um, we it it, it kind of works as a double-edged sword right because we are so community like clannish right that we everybody either rises together or doesn't it's, right? it's and so, the original ride or dies right yeah <laughs> yeah i think yep. yeah i do i think that you know i can see where that's breaking down in some places you know over the decades of our people being here but for the most part there is this like you know, we, we're in this together. Mm -hmm. Oh, you Samoan? Okay, we got you, yeah. you know? Um, and I think part of that is because, you know, our community, our Samoan community here in the Northwest was relatively, you know, you know, compared to other lots of, you know, numbers wise, we're not as large in that way and big numbers, but, you know, but there is something that says, I see you, you know, and so we, we're gonna roll together. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a gift, you know, I, I've seen it in our own congregation where that has been, you know, where in versus, you know, a, a worldview that says it's about me, mm -hmm. you know, um, me and mine and my family and, you know, you know, so that those are things that I think are gifts. It also works against us in some places where, you know, like any good thing can, um, mm -hmm. your strength can become kind of your Achilles, but those are things that I think are beautiful about our people. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, and I think that's the, the joy, at least for me at PSR, um, with so many Pacific Islander students, um, is wanting to see that come out of the students more. And like, that's, I, I feel like that's my, my hope as a professor is that I can help bring that out more because the, sort of internalized colonization makes us compartmentalize it sometimes. And so we say, okay, we can be community here with other Samoans or Tongans or Fijians or whoever, um, but, we, but we're gonna operate sort of individualistically here because mm -hmm. they don't want that gift. But I think you're right. This is the moment in time that we be unapologetically ourselves. And we, I think we need to be more of ourselves in a much broader and larger and like wonderful way um, mm -hmm. because our communities need that. Well, one of the other things too that I think I would add here also, and as, as I'm thinking about you and, and your work with students, one of the things that I know that you can depend on, like hands down, if you need help, <laughs> but it is. I think. I was gonna because, let you say it. I wasn't gonna say it. <laughs> no, gonna because we, we're kind of wired in our DNA to serve. Yeah. Right. Um. It is. It is a part of our cultural. Like, if you're raised as a someone person and you don't serve, you're like no good. <laughs> you are. You are like considered. You know, sort of like you're shy, Like you're a waste. Like, why yeah. are you here? You're not serving. You know. And oh, so you've seen this. Yeah. You've seen this in our community. You've seen this, you know, and kids learn this from very, very yeah. young. Yep. You know, everybody is responsible for everything. And yeah. so, you know, kids are working, they're, they're, you know, and back 
you know, back in the day, and I wasn't living back in the day on the islands with my parents, but, you know, I see this all the time with children. They're, they're part of the work. And mm-hmm. so our kids aren't afraid of work. Um, mm-hmm. Now they're going to have fun while they work. Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> Be closely I supervised. Dance the through. <laughs> yeah, but you know, I you know, you know, you know, all kidding aside, I think that that's one of the things that I love. Like even with me and you know my role in the community and my role at the church, I know today if I call a young person and said, "Hey, you know, I need this," they they will be here, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and they don't complain, and they just know that. And even in our church, right. Like if I'm, if, if the Samoans who are elders are sitting in the fellowship hall, the young people will come over and say, you know, can I get you coffee? Can you blah, blah, blah. And so the white folks are watching the young people wait on us, right? And even when I say, hey, to a young person, can you go over and make sure that Dorothy and Homer have what the, the, the white folks are like, this is just like, what? <laughs> you know? So, but what services. Are, what a are, gift. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think. I, it plays out differently with Filipinos, but but that reciprocity, right? So young people can serve like that because they know they will also get taken care of. There, it's it's not that scarcity game. It's that yeah. if we continue to give ourselves abundantly to one another, everything works really well. Mm-hmm. I, I I don't know if I'm reading that yeah. right, but that's no, nope, that's right. But yeah. that, you raise like my mom. I can hear her as you're talking, just saying, you know, we do this because this is the way it works. Like yeah. one day you're going to need, one day you're going to need your, your Aina, your family mm-hmm. and they will be there. And she was absolutely right. Cause you know, you, when you grow up in the States and you know, like I can hear and my parents were always really worried that, you know, us, them raising us in the state that we were going to become more Palangi, meaning more mm-hmm. white. Right. Mm-hmm. And we were going to abandon our cultural stuff and little things that would happen, you know, and you, maybe you heard this too, you and your parents say, Oh no, that doesn't, that's that's white folks that's way white folks that doesn't work here you know <laughs> i heard you know, you know if we were if we were americans we would uh which they were but um if if we were white essentially is what she was my mom would say is um you'd be paying me rent right now <laughs> right right my parents they could not even like when we would tell them stories about our friends and like their parents once they graduate from high school if they don't have a job they're gonna have to pay rent yeah and my dad was like my mom was like what that's so sad (laughs) (laughs) and she goes that's really wrong you know Um, but by the the same time you know my parents were very quick to tell us you know when we would ask questions like why are we why are we at everybody's, why are we always, basically, why are we always giving our money to other people mm. to help? Yep. To serve? Why are we always the ones? And, you know, and it, it's a beautiful thing. It's beautiful. And I, you know, like, this is the way I think about this in terms of our budget at the church. You know, if we had a little bit more of the way, this way of thinking about generosity and understanding mm-hmm. that w- the God's principle, like when we show up and we build community, folks are going to be there for us too. It's yep. not about scarcity. Yep. And that's yep. my mom really, she taught us that. She said, we do that, we give and we serve because one day we're going to need it. And she said, my mom always said, mark my words. <laughs> and she was right. Yeah, you know. that's beautiful. Well, thank you so much for all of that, for sharing your stories, for sharing your life with us. Yeah. I, as always, am always blessed by any time I get with you, Lena. <laughs> <laughs>